In this series of videos, we'll be taking a look at how you complete a basic setup and configuration of a Synology network attached storage device. Our aim is to offer a point of reference that you can use to help you integrate a NAS into a home network. A network attached storage device, or as it's more commonly referred to, a NAS, is a device that connects to your home network to allow you to store and retrieve data from a centralized location. However, purchasing a Synology NAS can be a daunting prospect. This is because there are so many models to choose from, and if you're not convinced that having a NAS would be useful to you, the cost may be putting you off. That's why before you purchase any NAS, you need to have a clear idea in your mind what you intend to use the NAS for. Perhaps you want to use the device as a file store, or use the NAS as a centralized backup point for your home computers. You might want to create a media server, or host your own websites. Once you've made the decision to invest in a NAS, the next thing you need to decide is the number of ports and connectors that you might need. To help you make that decision, let's take a tour of a typical Synology NAS, and along the way we can point out some of the useful features that you should consider having on your NAS. Usually, on the front of any Synology NAS, you will see a status light along with indicator lights for each of the hard drives that can be fitted to the NAS. In this example, this NAS has four hard drive indicator lights. Next, we have a USB port on the front of the unit, which is very handy. Finally, we have the power switch to turn the unit on and off. At the rear of the NAS, we have a port for the power brick. We also have a recessed reset switch next to the one gigabit network port. It's always worth checking before you buy a NAS that the network port on the NAS is rated at at least one gigabit. Next, we have an eSATA port and two USB 3 ports, all very handy for adding additional external storage to a NAS. This hole is a Kensington security slot, which is part of a really simple anti-theft system designed to prevent anyone from just picking up your NAS and walking away with it. Finally, we have a sticker with the device's MAC address and serial number. These two pieces of information may be needed if you ever need to talk to Synology's technical support team. Let's remove the cover plate from this NAS and take a look at the drive bays. You can see that we have caddies inserted into the four drive bays with each caddy having its own handle. Above each caddy we have a tab marked push. To remove a caddy from its bay we need to press the tab button with our thumb and then pull the caddy by the handle. When purchasing your NAS you need to consider what your current and future requirements will be. With this in mind we recommend that if possible you avoid buying a single bay NAS device as their scope for future expansion is limited. Instead, it's better to have a spare drive bay available to accommodate any future storage requirements that you might have. The caddy is a simple piece of plastic which supports the hard drive while it's in the hard drive bay of the NAS. It's designed to minimize vibrations and ensure that the connectors on the hard drive line up with the connectors on the NAS. As you can see, the hard drive is secured to this caddy by four screws. However, there are some models of NAS whose caddies do not use screws, so you need to check the user guide when you receive your NAS. A nice touch is this arrow that indicates how the caddy should be reinserted back into the NAS. As this model of NAS was not supplied with a hard drive, out of the box it cannot be used. Instead, we have to separately purchase and then fit a 3.5 inch hard drive to the drive caddy of our NAS. When purchasing a 3.5 inch hard drive, it's best to choose a recognised manufacturer, and while it's not essential, try choosing a model of drive designed for use in a NAS, as this should guarantee compatibility with the NAS, but also offer enhanced reliability and better heat management. As a starting point, it's worth taking a look at either the Western Digital Red or Seagate Iron Wolf models of hard drive. With regards to the size of the hard drive that you should purchase, we recommend that you consider buying a drive with the largest capacity that you can afford. 
If you intend to store media files or backup devices to your NAS, lower capacity drives will quickly fill, which means that ultimately you end up spending more money replacing that drive. If you have a NAS with multiple drive bays, it's best practice to fit the first hard drive to the first drive bay. Then work sequentially adding drives to the next corresponding bay as and when you need to add more storage. When slotting a hard drive into one of the bays of the NAS, you will find that the caddy will only fit in one way. By ensuring that the arrow on the caddy handle is pointing to the top of the NAS, you should find that the hard drive will correctly fit into place. We are now ready to physically connect the NAS to our home network. At the rear of your wireless router, you should find a number of network ports. Taking one end of a network lead, connect it to one of the network ports on the rear of your wireless router. Now taking the other end of the network lead, connect it to the network port on your NAS. With our NAS now connected to our wireless router, let's recap on what we've done so far. First, we familiarise ourselves with a typical model of Synology NAS. We then discuss purchasing and fitting a hard drive to a NAS drive bay. Finally, we physically connected the NAS to our existing network. In the next video in this series, we'll be taking a look at installing the NAS operating system and completing the initial setup of Synology's Disk Station Manager.